The ACLU defends your liberties, whether you're on the right, the left, or entirely off the political grid. The 100-year-old organization has argued and won landmark decisions before the United States Supreme Court and assisted countless citizens and non-citizens to obtain or keep their rights. After the terrible events in Charlottesville in the summer of 2017, when one person was murdered and two officers died in relation to a far-right rally, whose organizers had obtained legal aid from the ACLU to hold the rally, the organization's nonpartisan agenda was widely discussed. Is it right to put principle above all other considerations and offer legal aid to all comers, including neo-Nazis, whose agenda goes against the beliefs of many Americans? Or could there be factors beyond the ideals of the law that inform such actions? David Cole is the legal director of the ACLU. He took an hour out of his nonstop schedule to speak to me about the ACLU's commitment to civil liberties, about the role of free speech in our democracy and on campus, and about the best ways to defend our personal civil liberties during the Trump presidency. Cole directs a program that includes approximately 1,400 state and federal lawsuits on a broad range of issues. He's the author of over 10 books, most recently, Engines of Liberty, How Citizen Movements Succeed, and he's been granted several honorary degrees and given many prizes for his work. He publishes widely and is currently on leave from Georgetown University, where he teaches constitutional law and is the Honorable George J. Mitchell Professor in Law and Public Policy. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. Welcome, I'm sitting here with David Cole. Thank you, David, for joining me on Think About It today. Great to be here. So, David, you are the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. You're overlooking New York Harbor, just showed me the Statue of Liberty. First of all, you're really busy these days. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking time, and I thought I wanted to start with a really brief quote that you've been fond of quoting by Learned Hand, Judge Learned Hand, mm -hmm. one of the great justices in our country. The quote that you know better than I do, liberty lives and dies in the hearts of men and women. And this idea that it lies in the hearts of men and women, when it dies, there are no constitution, no law, no court can save it, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. And you've quoted this a couple of times, and I was interested what you actually think animates our commitment to liberty as a principle. This justice said it's in the heart of people, not in their brains, not in their legal training, not in the courts, not in the Constitution, but it comes from somewhere else. Wow, so that is a question that we don't often get in law school. Uh, where does it come from? It comes from the Constitution. But you know, where does it come from? Probably the person who answered it best was John Stuart Mill in On Liberty. But I think it's part of being a, a human being, is having the autonomy to make decisions for oneself, the liberty to choose one's course of one's path in life, the freedom to be an individual within a collective. To me, those are all part of what it means to be a free and fully realized human being. So I think it's very deeply rooted in our species. The Mill quote and this quote by Leonard Hand, it's rooted in individuals, right? It's my personal way of wanting to conduct my life, right. my way of expressing myself. Right, right. So before it becomes the law for everyone, or before it becomes the Constitution that binds us together. So it's deeply personal in that way, right? Absolutely, and it has to be mediated by the community and by the demands of the collective, and that's really what constitutional law is about. It's about deciding when is it appropriate for a collective to coerce an individual to take actions that he or she may not want to take, like pay taxes, and when is it permissible for the individual to coerce the collective by insisting on his or her right to engage in a religion that the collective would like to extirpate from the face of the earth. When I think about the ACLU, part of what 
you've been so clear about in the last couple of years is to say that the ACLU defends the liberties, plural, for everyone. It doesn't really take side. It's famously, it's 100 years old now, happy birthday. Thank you. Great organization. And it defends the rights of everyone and not just certain groups. So it's nonpartisan in that sense. Absolutely. So when you get up in the morning and you think, okay, I have to go through my day today, I have to strategize and think about it. How do you make sense of all these different people who have such different ideas of what their liberty actually means? And they actually think my liberty is maybe not quite your liberty. Right, absolutely. There are different conceptions of liberty. We have a particular conception of liberty, which has been developed over the century and is reflected in a series of board policies that take on any issue we might conceive of in constitutional law, the board has taken it up and we have developed a principle. And that principle is not shared by everybody, but once we commit to a principle, we defend that principle regardless of whether we agree with you on other issues or not. That's the sense in which I think we are an organization of principles. So, you know, famously, we represented the Nazis in Skokie. We represented the Ku Klux Klan in Brandenburg versus Ohio, which is the case that really established the high watermark of protection for subversive speech. We represent lots of communists. You know, the communist doctrine was not consistent with ACLU doctrine, but we nonetheless mm -hmm. defended them. We defended the individual who sought the permit in Charlottesville. We defend lots of religious groups and organizations whose normative commitments we don't share, but we defend their right to exercise their right of religion. So in that sense, we're principled. But no one could possibly reflect all the liberty conceptions of every American because they're in conflict. They're in conflict. You've talked about this and the cases you just brought up. So Skokie, 1976 Six, and seven, 77. Seven, seven. Yeah. So the ACLU takes a position to say, we disagree, perhaps we don't even need to issue that statement. We disagree entirely with what they're saying, but they are right to say is what we will defend. And yeah, we said precisely that. And the Skokie case, before we get to the Charlottesville case, which you also mentioned, and the Brandenburg case before that, but the Skokie case was a case that has sort of crystallized the ACLU's position to say, we are committed to principles, but not to the content of what people express, this kind of counter-neutral idea, which is also part of the law. And Skokie, in some ways, is the definition of what this principle stands is. When I speak with students, or I teach, and I'm not a legal scholar, but Skokie is kind of a watershed moment also culturally in America. And I want to ask you one thing specifically about the role of an organization such as the ACLU or the presidency that provides not just legal but also moral leadership. So when Skokie happened, Jimmy Carter was kind of cornered by a journalist, and he was not happy about it, and someone pushed a microphone into his face and said, what do you think about this march? And Carter said, this is abhorrent, not American. I abhor these points of view. This is not something we should have in this country. We have in the South, the Klan, these terrible organizations. But we should leave it to the courts to decide whether they can march. So Carter kind of said, it's not my role in the office of the president to say something about this here, and the courts should decide. And that, I think, gave the ACLU also a space to say, look, it's a legal issue here. We can condemn this morally, and we have the president condemning it. Then from Carter to Reagan, to Reagan, to Clinton, to Clinton, to Bush, to Obama, to Obama, every president has always consistently said, we abhor what these people say, but they have a right to say this. Do you think the Skokie decision looks different today? And I'm asking because my students ask and say, well, was it really that good then to defend these people? Why did that get defended? Did it help America? Did we progress? I am a firm believer in protecting the rights to speak of those who the majority would reject and suppress. And I believe that entails protecting those who I would like to suppress in some respects because their views, their substantive views, are directly contrary to mine. And that's certainly true with, with all of these organizations. But I believe that if we were to empower government officials to make those decisions, we would be a substantially less free country. And those who would suffer, you know, would be the Klan and would be the Nazis, but it would also be Black Lives Matter it would be feminists, it would be peace activists. And that's not theoretical, that's our history demonstrates that. And if you give the government the power to make these decisions in a democracy, they're gonna be made by 
majoritarian processes and by government officials who are responsive to majoritarian processes. That means those who criticize the status quo risk being suppressed. The reason President Carter, Jimmy Carter, said let the courts decide was because he is a president. He is a political representative. He has to run for re-election. He can't take the heat mm -hmm. of protecting their rights. The majoritarian processes would say suppress them, but they would also say suppress Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's critically important to have a principle that says government officials don't have that authority. And in order to have that principle realized, you have to have independent courts mm -hmm. who aren't worried about losing their reelection by protecting the unpopular group. So there's two worries. One is the government would have too much power, which was, that is really what the First Amendment spells out. Doesn't say much beyond that, really, that what, besides what Congress should not do, besides it doesn't have any real content, doesn't tell you this type of speech, that type of speech, all these things are then decisions. So it's the government's role, and the other worry is this kind of, if one group gets into trouble, other groups may get into trouble too. Those may be the groups you like. Absolutely. When you said, yeah, so absolutely. the first one, the government should stay out of the business of regulating speech based on what it likes and doesn't like. Some people would say the government has always been in the business of that. There's exemptions. First Amendment doesn't protect all sorts of speech. There are all sorts of things that are kind of carved out, as we know. The courts have always recognized those carve out. But to say that you don't want to give it to the government, Carter stepped out of that space. We have a government now that actually steps quite into that space, quite directly, and says we have a role here. We actually have opinions here. We actually favor one speech over other speech. So what my students are trying to figure out, to say from 77 to 2017, did this really benefit America to protect especially this kind of speech because we were so worried that otherwise Black Lives Matter couldn't protest? They said, well, that's exactly what happened. We have a president now who actually wants to jail journalists not have press conferences, fire football players for political protests. So he said the government has taken a role. Yeah, the key is wants to. Okay. Right? I mean, President yeah. Trump has said all kinds right. of anti-First Amendment things. Right. That, but what has he done in terms of actually mm -hmm. taking action to suppress speech? No. The one time he did when he kicked out a reporter from the White House press court, he was sued. A Trump appointee in district court in, in Washington, D.C., ruled that he violated the First Amendment and he followed the ruling. So that's exactly why the fact that we have a president like Trump mm -hmm. should only underscore, mm -hmm. particularly to your students, who I presume mm -hmm. for the most part are not Trump supporters, why you would not want to give the government right. the power to decide whose speech gets to be heard and whose doesn't. And it's because we have a very strong tradition of protecting free speech that's even somebody like Trump who is otherwise you know tremendously autocratic has not taken that further step of really cracking down right, on right. press he speaks out against the press speaks out against free speech rights but he doesn't dare take action and the one time he did he was slapped back do you think that he doesn't hold a regularly scheduled press conference? It's an issue, maybe not a legal issue, maybe he's legally entitled to do that, but are the American people served under the idea of the First Amendment that actually government speech is also something we are entitled to? Entitled to, I mean, I think at some point in a democracy, there's no constitutional obligation to have a press conference, right. but in a democracy, the accountability is at the polls. And if you are not willing to speak to the people and explain your decisions and be accountable to questioning, you're likely to lose support. Well, as we know, he's, he has pretty good access to the public. Because he, he, does, he does. So uh, he has yeah, no he, problem he, not he, speaking yeah, to the yeah. media because he knows what the media are. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. And he's also subject to robust criticism right. within the media. And I you know that's as it should be. I want to go back to one thing you said. You said that the government shouldn't have this power to control speech. And some people would say, a lot of people have said to the ACLU, the government has always exercised this power. It is a kind of a mischaracterization of America that everyone has the same rights because people are situated differently, people have different types of access, people have different types of opportunities, and certain speech is policed much more, harassed much more, made much more difficult. So the idea that the neo-Nazis and Black Lives Matter are equivalent, who people say no. There's no equivalency between them, but they both reflect minority viewpoints. And that is why they are being suppressed in a majoritarian mm. democracy, unless you have constitutional guardrails that say 
the majority can't do X and Y. And one of the things the majority can't do is suppress speech that it doesn't like. As to the fact that the government draws distinctions based on content in certain areas, yes, but in very limited areas, right? And for the most part, they are where speech is so close to action that it causes real cognizable harm. So fighting words where it basically you know, mm -hmm. is going to start a fight or speech that is intended and likely to produce imminent criminal conduct. You, know, you can advocate criminal conduct as long as it's not that close to the actual criminal conduct or a threat, a true threat. If I threaten in a realistic way to kill you, that you know, imposes right. direct personal harm. Beyond that, there's not that much. I mean, for a long time, we didn't protect obscene speech. The ACLU has always been critical of the obscenity doctrine precisely because it runs counter to everything in the First Amendment, right? The First Amendment says the fact that society doesn't like a particular kind mm -hmm. of co communication is reason to protect it, not to suppress it. And yet under the obscenity doctrine, if something is deemed offensive by enough people, it's not protected. The obscenity doctrine is basically a, a thing of the past. It no longer exists because it was rendered moot by the internet, essentially. But for the most part, where speech can be penalized, it is because it is so close to illegal conduct mm -hmm. that the interest in pro, you know, stopping the conduct justifies the speech. But when people talk about you know, hate speech and people talk about the harm caused by hate speech, that's a significant step removed. It is not one step from a violent action. And sometimes people call it violent, but that's a metaphor. Well, some people disagree. Some people do think it can be, if it's systemic, pervasive, and directed at individuals, it could be psychologically harmful in a yeah. way that they would consider actually clinically diagnosable. Well, and it's actionable so, and not protected right. in a variety of contexts in that. So, so that's an important Sexual harassment, uh, right. racial harassment, individually directed, right. not protected by the First Amendment. But that's, again, because at that point we're saying, there's a particular individual, there's a particular harm that's occurring to this individual. We're not talking about some broad concern about we don't like what the message is saying or we don't like the politics of the person or the politics person are not sufficiently respectful of others. Those kinds of arguments I think are dangerous. I do have to ask you one of my favorite cases, because I'm not a lawyer, so the bong hits for Jesus. So there are high school students who posted this outside yeah. of their school and they put that on a sheet. It used to be in the museum in Washington. Actually, yeah. they had that sheet. And that was declared not protected speech for students yeah. because it advocated illegal behavior to smoke pot. In some ways, you just said it's so hard to regulate hate speech because it's not clear unless it's directly inciting violence toward an individual person who's present in yeah. that space and it's likely to happen and imminent. Other people say, it's not that difficult to figure this out. We have hate speech in this country for so long, and certain types of speech are so easily recognized as actually inciting people to do things against particular individuals. Why is another category, why does the court sometimes say, this speech makes people buy or smoke pot, we have to regulate this, so, but it bends over backwards yeah. to say, well, hate speech, we must protect. So Bong hits for Jesus, who I think was wrongly decided. The okay. ACLU <laughs> believed that that speech should have been protected. Right. But it, it arose in a particular context, which is the school, where the court has recognized that the school, as parents' patriarch and as educator, has much more control over student speech than the government does over adult speech. So you can't transfer right. the student context to the adult context, mm -hmm. just as you can't transfer the work context, where speech is much more regulated, mm -hmm. to the public context. Mm -hmm. So you know you have to make context specific decisions. I would make just two other points about hate speech regulation. You know, I think reasonable people can differ about this, obviously. Europe, most of Europe, prohibits hate speech. Australia, Brazil, India, and plenty South of, Africa. Plenty of countries do. Yes. I see no evidence that racism, white supremacy, xenophobia are any weaker in Europe than here. In fact, I think they're stronger. I think that the parties that reflect that point of view are stronger than they are here. Here the white supremacists are for the most part, you know, in their basements, you know, communicating with each other over the internet and when they come out in public they are met with massive counter protests and go back into hiding, which is what happened in Boston a week after Charlottesville. You know, in Europe you have major parties that are getting major votes and you know on those kinds of platforms. So I see very little evidence that these regulations actually work. 
number one. Number two, you know, I've spent my career defending people who have been the subject of government efforts at suppression. And one thing that happens every time the government seeks to suppress someone is that they give that person a platform. They give that person more attention. So for example, Richard Spencer. Mm -hmm. Who ever heard of Richard Spencer, a white supremacist? Who ever heard of him until a number of universities took back invitations to speak? Then suddenly, The Atlantic will write an entire feature on Richard Spencer. Before that, he was a kook that no one paid attention to. Milo Yiannopoulos, who's a client of ours in a case where we are suing the so Metro Center, Washington, right? along with we're representing ourselves, we're representing right. a pro-choice business, and Milo, because they've all been suppressed. But his celebrity is because of the efforts to suppress his speech. So I think it's counterproductive from the standpoint of those who dislike the speech. I think they will actually end up giving the person more of a platform. And again, I see no evidence on a comparative basis, no evidence that these kinds of regulations actually do what we care about, which is eliminating discrimination, in achieving right. equality, promoting respect. For I'll ask you something about this, that you said there's a kind of effect that they become martyrs for the free speech principle. We know that actually people you just named will believe that they are the only ones who defend the First Amendment rights in this country. Well, I don't and know that they, 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 actually know they will, believe They that. will position themselves in this way. And I do think there's yeah. one factor, first of all, that social media has made them very famous before the Atlantic picked them up and before any university actually heard of them. So I don't think it's a university. There's something else, though. If the government doesn't take a position, that used to be the Carter line, let's say. Now we have a government that actually takes a position. So people in a university, for example, saying, here's a moral position that actually people condone this point of view. They don't just defend an empty principle because we have a president who says, these people are actually okay. They actually express what America believes in. And people are saying, that is shocking to us and new to us, and it's actually new. As I said, from presidents from 1978 and so forth, they haven't done that. So I'm gonna ask you when you're saying, suppressing them gives them more of a platform because they become martyrs, et cetera, they can use that. Not suppressing them makes people not trust institutions. I'm putting it a little too sharply and say, my university or my government actually doesn't believe in my rights. It believes in the rights of people who want me to be deported, demeaned, or dead. Those are really the options offered. It's very different from Black Lives Matter, which is fighting for due process and the law. It's not fighting for a kind of racially pure state. I mean, there's yet no equivalencies. But I'm interested in this moral position when you're saying it's risky to give them more of a platform to let them march into court and say, hi, I'm the victim of this, this suppression, saying not to do it also makes, makes people wonder and say, maybe you actually like their position. No, no, not, not if you're clear. But the, I'm the saying, principle, but I with think, our government right now, it's not so clear. Well, you know, I don't know that it's not so clear. You have Donald Trump mm -hmm. saying you have good people on both sides. Mm -hmm. You had every other politician in Washington condemned what happened to Charles. Wow. Condemned, literally, from the Republican Party okay. to the Democratic Party. Go back and look. You will not find a single right. other government official who said the kind of thing that Donald Trump said. So, you know, so I'm pushing back a little yeah. on that. But again, you know, at the end of the day, the very fact that you don't like what Donald Trump said right. should lead you to be skeptical about giving Donald Trump right, right, the right. power right. to control who gets to speak and who doesn't. Let me ask you a more specific question about the ACLU, which you've responded to in a lot of different fora. People have said, well, but the ACLU taking a position to defend somebody who's now somewhat been blessed by the most powerful man in this country. Say so he was the only one in Washington. I don't believe really that all politicians spoke out. I do not believe this, but anyways, it doesn't matter. We all I'm saying is I don't think you'll find a, a single other politician who spoke in favor, and you will find boatloads, if you go back, you will find boatloads of Republicans and Democrats who condemn what happened. But there are a lot of people who are saying, nonetheless, the fact that he's equivocating a bit, even if he doesn't say anything, is creating problems in our country. And they're linking this directly to hate crimes, to the increase, the synagogue shootings, things like that. And they're saying, this is really a different world because moral leadership is lacking. So the ACLU's role, I think, is actually intensified in a way to say we have to provide leadership of what the First Amendment really protects and that we're not taking sides in these disputes over what political opinion is right. So I think, you know, look, we take a side on the question of equality. We think that the positions that, you know, white supremacists take are illegal, immoral, 
unjust. We make no bones about it. We are taking a moral position. On speech, we also take a moral position, which is that it is critically important that the avenues for protest mm -hmm. be free, and that in order for them to be free, that principle has to apply to the right as well as to the left, to the far right as well as the far left. You can't pick and choose. You can't say, oh, that principle applies to the people we like but, or the people we dislike only a little bit, mm -hmm. but not to the people we dislike more. Once you start drawing those lines, I think that's very dangerous. But that, that doesn't stop us in any way, shape, right. or form from condemning Donald Trump's policies across the board, from condemning the views of right. white supremacists across the board. And I think that's the way that it's appropriate to fight them. I think the appropriate response to the white supremacists was Boston. And I think it's very interesting what happened in Boston, right? In Charlottesville, we had a the Unite the Right groups came out and we had this horrific set of incidents, but they had scheduled a whole series of marches and demonstrations over the whole fall after that. That was in August. And the first one to follow on Charlottesville was in Boston. It was one week later. Mm -hmm. And they went to Boston, and there was a march, and a hundred or so white supremacists showed up, and 40,000 counter-demonstrators showed up. And in Boston, unlike Charlottesville, the police did their job. They kept them apart. The message was, we, society, condemn and reject your points of view. Mm -hmm. And what happened? What happened to the white supremacists? They canceled all of the rest of the marches that they had scheduled for the fall because they realized this is not a good look for us. And they went back into their basements and went back onto their internet where they didn't have to face the moral opprobrium of society. That's the way that the, the, I think society should We should reject their views. I agree And we should you. counter demonstrate, but we should not empower the government to suppress There's it. another big question here when you said they may or may not be in their basements. I actually think they're, some of them are very well funded. They're wearing their polo shirts and living in nice condos. They're on the internet. And in some ways, it makes me a little uncomfortable to think, oh, they've been defeated and they're just dispersed and not so many. They are, as we know, hugely connected. And as we know, they also have some effects. For example, I think they have been quite effective to make themselves into the martyrs of some campus protests. And they've been quite effective to drive someone like President Trump and Betsy DeVos and nine government agencies and departments into an executive order that is going to interfere in how universities operate. Those things, I think, are actually all effects. In some ways, I think you may be right to say they won't have another deadly rally. Let's hope so. When they thought they had the you know, support to go public, the mm -hmm. public's rejection of that right. led them to say, hey, we don't have this support. And no, I don't disagree with you that on the internet, they have a tremendous amount of power, and the internet complicates these things in all kinds of the ways. The ACLU have a way to engage with the internet as another forum, because it's the public as well. It's very complicated. Yeah, we engage with, we work with, we attend conferences and meetings with Facebook and Twitter and, and all the platforms that are trying to figure out what the appropriate way is to respond. And it's, you know, a lot of it is not really governed by the First Amendment as such because they're private platforms, but like private universities, they're to some degree, you know, guided by the kinds of mm -hmm. principles mm -hmm. that apply legally to public entities. But, you know, so Yale University is not bound by the First Amendment, but it will act in ways that are consistent with the First Amendment because it believes that's important to academic freedom. So too Facebook and Twitter, not bound by the First Amendment, but I think feel some constraints. They want an open platform. Right. And I think those are very hard questions. I don't know, I personally don't know what the right answers are. I think we have concerns about empowering a single centralized authority to decide what can and can't be said, you know, when you've got an entity as powerful in the marketplace of ideas as Facebook and Google and Twitter to give them the power to sort of just say what can and can't be said is scary in many of the same ways that giving the federal government or the state government of Arkansas power to control. And of course, there, there are lots of people who say they are already controlling it. We have a very robust discussion online that conservatives feel they have been actually censored on social media, that they don't get a fair yeah. share of the social media. Many of other people who say they allow right-wing groups to fester. And, yeah. and in some ways, if I want to sell something illegal on Facebook or put some highly obscene pornography on, it'll be removed in seconds. Yeah. Well, they're trying to work it out. Probably. Yeah, they're not a newspaper, and they're also not a government. 
And so, you know, the newspaper, like the New York Times, is engaged in the marketplace, but it makes editorial decisions all the time, and you have no right to have your op-ed in the New York Times. I'm glad you uh, say this. To be honest with you, this is a really good point, because people who complain, the people you named earlier, right-wing agitators, they get outraged when they don't get invited by this or that private university, and I said they have no right to be in these places. There's no inherent constitutional right no. to give a talk at the Yale Law School no. or at Berkeley sociology department. But somehow in the last two years, and I would like to hear what your sense of sort of take the temperature, how has it become a debate that when some right-wing agitator, who's really not a scholar of anything, is denied a platform in a university, the entire university is under attack, it's compromising the First Amendment. Let's not take Berkeley, but a private school. And this debate has become one debate to say the university has given up on free speech, whereas the university says, we actually have a mission. And we actually have a right to advance this mission. And some fool coming in and you know yeah. ranting is not fulfilling the mission. Yeah. But why has this debate become so pronounced, do you think? And this is more of a philosophical question, because I also felt I lived through the same debate in the 90s with cases you've argued, Karen yeah. Finley, maybe yeah. you've argued them in front yeah. of the Supreme Court. We had another debate about pornography, obscenity back yeah. then. And now we have this debate. Why is that? Well, and it's not new. I mean, in the, in the 70s, you had the same thing around the Vietnam War, where students were intolerant of voices that were in favor of the Vietnam War. And so, you know, when a military spokesperson was invited to speak at Yale, he was shouted down. Right. And in fact, Yale's free speech principles come out of that, right. out of that experience. Right. 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 So this is not new in any way, shape or form. Students have very strong views and very strong views and tolerance don't always go together very well. And I think the problem, to the extent there's a problem, the problem is largely student driven rather than administrator driven. And, you know, in, in terms of, in, of what, in the uh, sense that I yeah. think it's the students who are the ones who are shouting down, not allowing conservatives to speak out. It's not the administrations for the most part, it is the students. So at Middlebury or mm -hmm. when Ray Kelly sought to speak at Brown University or when the head of the ACLU of Virginia sought to speak at William and Mary, right. it's students shouting down and silencing people whose views they won't tolerate. And, 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 and can, can I just be, ask you with more specific, I'm really interested in this, they can't tolerate. And what do you think is behind this? Is this an unreasonable, they should just tolerate it, put up with this speech. Is that the recipe that will be good for everybody also? I think, that? so. I think that's the lesson of the First Amendment, is and I, toleration. And yes. I think this And I think it's critically important to a civil society where people have very different views that people tolerate those views they disagree well, and let's with. let's just stay with the student examples for a moment. I mean, all the examples that I've looked at pretty much invariably involve race in America. They're really never about flat earth or dinosaurs or some theory of economics. They're really almost always about... Sometimes they're about sexuality. Yeah, there's uh, very few people have probably been shut down, but maybe... Milo, some, let's for say, example. Probably for targeting people, that's right, and actually risking their safety. But in some ways, let's say... Students are saying something else. I think they're not saying, I don't tolerate this speech. They're saying, this speech interferes with my right to participate on equal terms in this institution, the equality rights. They say, this is more akin to a workplace. If someone runs around here all yeah. the time in this workplace and keeps harassing me for who I am, there's right. regulation that can't be accepted. So why bring in an outside speaker who targets me I'm identifiable in a crowd and says these people shouldn't be here, don't deserve yeah. to be here, don't have the right to be here, et cetera, which is illegal under Title VI yeah. and Title IX. So the students are saying, why is this so confusing that universities have been forced by the public to say, we are the ones who are creating a problem, we are the ones who are overly sensitive, rather than saying, the institution isn't doing its job to provide an equal... Because you're conflating very important distinctions. Yeah. So a university has an obligation to protect against targeted harassment of a racial or a sexual nature. Mm -hmm. It does not have an obligation to silence abhorrent views about women, men, mm -hmm. straight people, mm -hmm. gay people, black people, Asian people, what have you. That is not prohibited under any law. It is, in fact, protected by the Constitution. So, mm -hmm. so context makes a huge amount of difference. So if I'm a university president and I'm deciding on what speakers I want to come speak to my students, I'm going to want to get a range of views, but I'm going to want to get thoughtful people. I'm going to want people who are respectful of the views of others. Uh -huh. I'm not going to invite anyone even close to 
you know, Richard Spencer, and that is totally within my prerogative because my job is, is a curricular job. If I decide I'm going to empower students to make their own decisions because that's part of growing up and part of engaging students in public discourse is right. letting them make decisions about who they want to have come speak, and that's an important value, and I give them that authority. Then for me to come in and override that authority because I don't like what they've chosen, that gets closer to a problem. And it's certainly a problem when a group of students shout down a speaker so that he or she can't speak to other students who would like to hear from him. That, I don't think there's any justification for that. But the curricular obligation of the university president, so what you just touched upon is a, a lot of people have asked me in the last two years, first of all, where can you draw a line? You shouldn't draw a line at all. No, I mean, and I think the university, lines. actually, I work in a university, I'm in the business of drawing lines all day, yeah. every day. Yeah. You want to give a talk, I'm going to say, who are you? What are your qualifications? We'll invite you. Yeah. You want to give a talk in another department, I'll say, you can't give a talk in the biology department. You're not even qualified. Right. And you have no First Amendment protection. You ACLU you won't defend you. Yeah. But somehow it still ends up that you know, militant racists or right-wing white supremacists, they get somehow the press, they get the backing of people saying, oh my God, their First Amendment rights are violated. So why does this debate end up in the wrong place? And as you just said, I private don't university- the, I don't know if it's the wrong place. So I mean, another example is my classroom. Right. When I'm teaching at Georgetown Law School, I teach controversial subjects, which people feel very strongly, race, criminal law, constitutional law, and I insist that everybody speak with respect for yeah. those with whom they disagree, that no viewpoint should be condemned, but that everyone should speak with respect. And if I were in a public university, right. there'd be nothing wrong with my insisting upon that, because in order to have that conversation in that classroom, a certain amount of regulated civility is required, right? In the public, we don't allow regulation of civility in the same way because what we've seen is that when we have given the government that power, it abuses it. And so I think you have to draw distinctions. And a speech mm -hmm. that no one has to go to, that anyone who wants to go to can go to, anyone who doesn't want to go to doesn't have to go to, and anyone who wants to protest it outside is free to protest it outside is very different. I think students would be smarter if they didn't attend the speeches that they don't like and or protested outside of the speeches to make their points of view, to have a counter demonstration. They're playing into the hands of the right wingers when they engage in intolerance because then the right wingers say, well, you're being intolerant in my points of view. And you ask, why is this not happening to left wingers? Because right wingers are not suppressing the view, you know, there aren't many schools where you have massive numbers well, of you do have conservatives. religious institutions, Liberty University, I mean, Notre Dame, of course, there are lots of institutions. You don't have many where students invite in liberal speakers and they're shouted down by right-wing speakers. Now, I mean, years ago when I was defending the flag burners in the Supreme Court, you know, I remember going to American University and speaking about the rights right. of people to burn the flags, and there were a group of conservative right-wing students that sought to shout me down because I was ex articulating a point of view that they disagreed with. But that's, that is more the exception than the rule. I think most of the anecdotes about suppression are unfortunately students on the left being intolerant of what are abhorrent views. But again, abhorrent views is not yeah. a justification. I mean, it's, it's hard to say because, of course, you know, we have several thousand universities and colleges, tens and tens of thousands of events each year, and then a Somehow handful. the media yeah. picks up one case, and I, I talked to Peter Salovey of Yale, and he said I had one one-minute video on YouTube that gets viewed three million times. I had over a thousand events that year with very controversial positions, yeah. left, right, all sorts of things. I don't think it's a crisis, but I do think it's a concerning trend. To me, the broader concern is that there seems to be a kind of loss of faith in the value of free speech and of tolerance. And I think that is bad for democracy. That is not a good development. I think that the whole enterprise of democracy turns on free speech, free association, free press, civil society, academic freedom. Free elections. But free elections don't mean much if you can't speak yeah, freely. Yeah. So it is the First Amendment that yeah. keeps us 
together as a democracy. And I think there's a disturbing trend of just devaluing. Let me try reframing of this statement and whether that's correct or not, and I, I really don't know. Whether there's a distrust that the institutions that are supposed to protect these freedoms are actually working really on behalf of the minorities they're supposed to protect. That actually the Supreme Court, the legislature, the executive, are using free speech or defining it in ways that doesn't benefit all people. So it's not that they distrust free speech as a principle or they are no longer in favor of the First Amendment, but they're saying it is not used in the right way. And you know the debates around this, but that young people are saying what you call the First Amendment is a very specific interpretation that has not benefited a lot of people. Well, I think that then they're just wrong about but, their history. Well, they're wrong know. about their history. I mean, they look. I at, mean, they're major look. legal scholars who say this as well, right? So and they're like, also wrong about their so history. You can, so, so tell me how how do you reassure them that these constitutions are going to continue to be committed? I mean, Justice Kagan said we have to be careful that the First Amendment. She didn't say careful that the First Amendment has become a weapon, as she said in the Janus decision. So, a Supreme Court justice said. Let's be on alert here. We can use this principle for different ways. Every constitutional principle can be right. abused. There's no question about that. But I think this is a reflection of the fact that free speech principles are sufficiently established that they have been taken for granted and that people now are losing sight of the real risks of not having them. Mm -hmm and focusing on the kind of risks of having them. Because, you know, with any principle, you will find some, you know, uses for which it was you're not real happy. But, you know, if you look at how the First Amendment developed, it developed to protect unions who were collectively seeking to protect workers from the power of capitalism. It, it developed to protect communist and anarchist and civil rights activists mm -hmm. and anti-war activists who were being suppressed because the majoritarian government did not like what they were advocating for. And what were they advocating for? They were advocating for equality, mm -hmm. mostly equality and mm -hmm. peace. Mm -hmm. And it was through hard fought battles over 50, 70 years that we ultimately got to a point where the First Amendment is sufficiently robust and protective that you don't see that many sort of direct attempts to make it a crime, for example, to be a member of a group or to, you know, criminalize a particular doctrine, right? That was across the board in this country in the 1950s, not that long ago. But in the same way that sometimes people take the gains of feminism, you know, for granted, I think people sometimes take the gains of free speech activists for granted. And then they focus on the fact that corporations, wealthy people are using the First Amendment. Corporations and wealthy people use the First Amendment, they use the Equal Protection Clause, they use the Due Process Clause, they use every right in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the right is wrong mm -hmm. at its core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say something else to end this? The students really turn a lot on the fact that for a lot of them, hate speech is actually a clear thing, and they may have read Jeremy Waldron or not, or they may have actually studied this in law, but they also say, I actually kind of think I know what that is when I see it. And other people say, no, it's impossible to define. No. But all sorts of other things in the law get defined all the time, but this is the one thing people say we can't possibly define it. And they say, I actually know that there's other controversies in college classrooms around certain terms that people say, no, there's no question, it's not a debatable issue. This is a form of hate speech, even if it doesn't have to be regulated, it doesn't have a place in university. So you're saying the current way our jurisprudence is the best way. You're saying it's robust, it's strong, we should recommit to the way it's being interpreted right now. What if it changes in 20 years? What if actually you think... Well, I assume it will change in 20 years. <laughs> I'm not endorsing every jot and tittle of First Amendment doctrine, but I think with respect to the principle that the government cannot suppress speech because it expresses disrespect for another group in a quote-unquote hateful way, that principle I don't think should change, and I think we're doing the right thing with respect to that principle. And you think, because this is this next generation, they grew up, they're born digital, they're living on social media, how should they help the ACLU's efforts in a way to think through? Because what you, we started out by saying learned hands and liberty lies in the hearts of men and women, not just in the courts, yeah. they're not all going to go to law school, they yeah. want to do many other things. How should they actually deal with this that we live in a world where the public sphere is not just the marketplace or you know some yeah. commons in Boston but social media I don't know the answer right, but yeah. I think engagement is the answer mm -hmm. you know, in terms of young people I am a huge believer in the 
the importance of a robust civil society to the maintenance of a limited government, freedom, autonomy, democracy. And I think one of the things the United States has is a robust civil society. But what is a robust civil society? It is individuals coming together around shared commitments mm -hmm. to engage in the defense or advance of those principles. So whether it's you know the Lambda Legal Defense Fund or the Sierra Club or the ACLU or the NAACP Legal Defense Fund or similar groups on the right, you know the NRA, those are all they're civil society groups. And I encourage students to engage, to engage with organizations that advance and fight for the values that they believe in, and to engage in an affirmative way. Mm -hmm. to think about the answers as opposed to just about the criticisms. Because it's easy to be critical, but the real challenge is what's the alternative? What mm -hmm. should we be doing mm -hmm. affirmatively? And, and there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of challenges for this generation as they mature. And the more that they are engaged with civil society groups in confronting them, mm -hmm. the more they are acting as citizens, the more robust our democracy is, the more, I think, protection we have from autocracy, mm -hmm. from government abuse, and the like. No, I appreciate that. I think that's that's right. And as you said, the, uh, you've set this out where the ACLU you can join and pay $25 yeah. or, or quite yeah, a lot more. 25. So, so yeah. students, some students can do it. Maybe oh, the ones have, who are graduating have, this season, we have lots of young people. Yeah, yeah we, right. have, we have ACLU <laughs> chapters on college campuses. We have an affiliate in every state. Some of our affiliates have essentially young people's boards so we have a separate right. board for younger folks we have a real desire everybody you know understands that let me the bring future you, is the youth let me bring you back before you went to law school why did you decide to go into the law oh my god that's a no, no 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 we need to know i need uh, to because i this is graduation season there the, yeah. the couple I tens to, of thousands, went, hundred thousand kids who are graduating college right now you know, <laughs> i have a very idiosyncratic i went to law school with zero interest in practicing law i felt that it would be a continuation of my liberal arts education it was i wanted to be a writer i wrote freelance while i was in law school i wrote for the undergraduate school newspaper while i was in law school I took time off from law school and worked for the Atlantic for a semester. I took another semester off. I was all set up to work for the nation. And then I, over the course of my time in law school, I worked for about five or six public interest organizations. And the last one I worked for was the Center for Constitutional Rights in here in New York City. And it completely turned me around. And my summer there led me to believe that, in fact, I wanted to be a lawyer, not a writer. I saw that my interest in writing could be put to good use in writing briefs, that the center was a creative litigant, to put it mildly, and I found that very inspiring, and I have not regretted it at all. I mean, I'm also a writer now, right. but I love both aspects. The fact that you can use reason and analytical abilities to fight for justice, and that you can make a living fighting for the things you care about every day, I think a tremendous, tremendous privilege, and I, I backed into it through law school. It's the exact path. That's good. So thank you, David Cole. I really appreciate it. We're still looking at the Statue of Liberty, and it's still standing. When I came in, you said every morning you look out, and or every evening, as long as it's still standing. So I thank you for all the really important work you're doing. Well, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. for the conversation. Thank you.